Greetings. It's time for another vintage computer teardown. This time it's the Sand Coupe from Miles Gordon Technology. Apparently only about 12,000 of these were made, so it's not often you'll find one. Let alone two. The one on the right is one I bought from MGT when it first came out in late 89, early 90. The one on the left I bought second hand off a friend of mine about a year later. As you can see, the one on the right has got the, one of the optional floppy drives fitted. What you can't see, unless you switch it on or open it up, is that it's also got a newer ROM and a RAM expansion. Speaking of which, let's switch them on. You'll notice two things different between the two running side by side. One is that ROMs 1.2 and earlier only cycle the border during power up. The other is that the 512K machine cycles twice as much because it's got twice as much RAM to check. Now the difference in picture quality between the two isn't related to the sand coupes, it's actually to do with the TV itself because whatever's on the left hand side it will show as a better quality picture than the one on the right. The one on the left is showing proper RGB, the one on the right is obviously being dropped down to composite or S video. The one on the left is ROM 1.0, the one on the right is ROM 3.0. Now you can tell what ROM it's got by typing in print peak 15 and dividing the result by 10. There's a socket on the back so they can load and save to and from tape. Although obviously these can be a bit temperamental unless you've got a decent tape deck. Fitting one or two optional floppy drives is as simple as popping off the front cover, taking the drive, slotting it home, and fastening two screws at the bottom. Unfortunately, some of my floppy disks are rather the worse for wear, thanks in part to me leaving them in the garage for 10 years. Defense of the Earth has got bad sectors and I haven't been able to read a good copy of it. Um, Sphera also has some bad sectors, but I've managed to read a good copy of it on the, um, on the PC upstairs using the program called SamDisk. And I've written it back to another good disk, one of the few decent double density disks I have. I shouldn't have chucked all those discs in the washing machine a while back. Now, I've not got any joysticks or joy pads that will work properly with the SAM, so I'm just going to run the Sphera demo and cut out the disc loading bits.
And the hardware is designed to be Sinclair ZX Spectrum compatible, well the 48k Spectrum at least. And as the machine runs a lot faster than the real Spectrum, that means that all the uh, all the music all plays a lot higher at a much higher pitch. But what it means is that Spectrum games can be loaded in from tape, and then you can push the non-maskable interrupt button at the back and save a snapshot of that game off the disc. In the case of Jet Set Willy, obviously you do this after entering the code from the copy protection card. And of course, like I said, you can snapshot this, or in the case of Jet Set Willy, you can quit out of the emulator and do some pokes. Uh, walk the nasties, yes, yeah, do that one. Uh, no more nasties, just clear all the rest. Work? Nope. <laughs> okay, so maybe not all the pokes are working properly. Bigger games that would load from tape in multiple sections can also be handled with a bit of work. Uh, Robocop is, an ex is such an example of uh, a multi-loading game. And I'm pretty sure I modified this myself to load the whole lot into RAM, but that was 20 years ago. <laughs> Goodness knows how I've done it. So that's a little bit about what it can do. Let's take a look around the machine and then take a look inside. On the back, we've got the non-maskable interrupt or brake button. Then there are two MIDI ports, which also double up as network ports, which is why they've got seven pins apiece. So you can link up to 16 SAM coupes together. Then there's a joystick port which is another non-standard port because it's got two strobe pins on it so you can use a splitter and connect two standard joysticks to it all uh, at once but uh, if you're using anything fancy like a controller or something like that which expects power uh, they seem to just freak out and not work then there's a, a light pen connector no sorry there's a mouse connector which is non-standard reset button there's an expansion connector of which the bottom and top rows are used. There's a tape jack which is um, on a spectrum you'd have a microphone and a ear output which is separate. This is combined. Uh, then we have a light pen output which also has uh, stereo audio, again non-standard. The power button Scart socket, a standard scart socket. Uh, no, it's not. Non standard. The scart socket, as you can see here, uh, it not only has the analog outputs, it's got the light pen input and it's also got uh, TTL, uh, digital monitor output as well. You could use a specially wired cable if you're going to use scart. Then we have the power connector, which is a six pin DIN, and again, it's non standard. It's got 12 volts, it's got 5 volts, and it also carries the left audio channel and video channel out because there's no, as you can see, there's no RF modulator on the back of this. To connect to the TV, if you're not going through SCART, you have to use the power supply, which, if it looks suspiciously like an Amstrad power supply, that's because it uses the same case. The LED isn't normally fitted, I've got because I've got two of them, I fitted a pair of LEDs, 
I used to use them to uh, switch between one and the other with the uh, the RF model leaders, but uh, not anymore. Uh, this has got uh, obviously mains connection coming in. It's got the six pin DIN plug and a standard antenna output, channel UHF channel 36. Going back to the, the SAM, of course, we've also got the keyboard, which is under, underneath all this, it's actually, uh, I believe it's a membrane keyboard, similar to the, the ZX Spectrum keyboard or lots of other keyboards these days, actually. And when this came out, it seemed like a rather daft position to put the keyboard, actually, at the back. But of course, these days, if you look at um, keyboards where you've got uh, wrist rests, that's exactly what you've got. Your hand rests on the machine with easy access to the keyboard. Around the front, we've got the two floppy ports. On the side, we've got these strange feet. And there's not much else to see. Let's have a look inside. Now I've got them both open, so you can see the difference between one which is not meddled with at all, and one which is most definitely meddled with. They're both uh, version 1.1 boards, approximately the same age. And what we have is, let's go through the main, the normal board first. We have a small optocoupler here on the MIDI interfaces. You always find uh, one of those on the MIDI inputs, I think, or MIDI outputs, I can't remember, one or the other. You always get uh, one of those to opto-isolate the input. Um, we've got the ROM. And this is a 1.0 ROM, the original ROM that it, that it came with. The other unit, the other machine has the version 3 ROM. To change it, it's simply a case of prying out the ROM and banging in a new ROM or EEPROM. Then we've got um, the ASIC. Now, on a Spectrum, you'd have the ULA, the Uncommitted Logic Array, uh, doing all the odds and ends that uh, otherwise you'd need a whole board of chips to do. And this is much the same thing. This is why the board is so sparsely populated, because most of the stuff goes on in there. We've got two Siemens um, HYB 514256A chips. Um, I think they're I think they're four bit chips. So you have the two together to give you an eight bit um, eight bit memory. Uh, there's the port then for expansion, and notice the, um, the serial number sticker from the bottom is actually double sided, it's printed on both sides, which is one side's adhesive. Going up further over to the side, then we have a Philips SAA1099, which is a six channel sound chip. And we have an MC1377P, which is uh, an RGB to PAL or NTSC encoder. Uh, coming along the back as well, then, of course, we've got the Z80. It says Z80A there. It's actually a Z80B. It's a 6 megahertz chip. That's why it says Z84OB. So um, it is actually a Z80B. And chip-wise... That's it. There's nothing on the underside. It's it's quite a, a simple design. Now let's go up to the other machine and look at the difference. This is the Vision 3 ROM, which is posted out by Miles Golden Technology as an upgrade to the previous one. We have different chips here this time. These are Timex. TMS 44C256s, uh, 10N, I think that's 100 nanosecond RAM. Uh, the previous ones are marked up as 70, so they might be 70 nanosecond RAM. I think slightly faster RAM on the other one. But you can see here, we've got 
an expansion board. 256, another 256. We've got another VLSI chip, which is actually a replacement VLSI chip. This machine was actually sent back for repair. Um, what was the excuse? Lightning strike, I think was. I think the excuse was. In practice, it was me fiddling around and I managed to blow it. Uh, then we have this small circuit here and obviously a replaced headphone jack. Uh, this circuit is based on one from, um, I think it's based on one from a map, from one of the Maplin Projects books uh, for uh, improving loading reliability on the ZX Spectrum. So it takes the, the waveform in and it runs it through, I think, a logic chip to sort of sharpen up the wave and um, make it more reliable. And, well, it's a bit hit and miss, but uh, well, there you go. Um, no other modifications to this machine, it's just that. Uh, obviously over here then you can see we've also got the, the floppy drive which I've taken the lid off for. If you ever have one of these which is out of alignment, you rotate that motor, you loosen these screws slightly and rotate the motor to adjust the position slightly of the, uh, the tracking. I don't mean rotate the, the rotor, I mean the actual motor itself, you twist it. Um, I had to do that because when I changed the belt on this, which it snapped, uh, I managed to knock it out of alignment. So uh, the belts for these, by the way, look on eBay, you'll find them. Um, I'll put the, the description of the actual the belt size uh, in, the, uh, in the video description. Uh, over here then we have uh, a VLSI VL1772, which is the, uh, the drive controller chip, and a little bit of logic, and that basically means that the drive interface comes with the drive, uh, which isn't a standard drive. It's not 34 pin, I think it's 26 pins. It's uh, it's a different type of connector. It's um, basically, this, it's the same, same pins, but in, in a different arrangement. Because uh, these drives are, uh, they're actually closer to uh, like old style laptop drives rather than the full height ones. And as far as inside a sand coupe goes, that's it. Actually, there's two other things I forgot to cover. Uh, on the back of the machine, on some of them, you can see the NMI and reset buttons are black buttons. And these are, in fact, what you see on the box. And on others, which you can see why the hole is slightly bigger, you get these slightly chunkier black and red buttons. Presumably, it depends on what was available at the time. Also, I ought to take a look in the power supply in the massive 11.2 watt power supply and we have a linear transformer I notice there are only four rectifier diodes in here so I'm not sure exactly how the two voltages are derived um, it may be um, some half wave rectification or uh, it might be uh, a um, uh, you know, uh, 606 six volt winding with an extra 6 volts on the top, something like that, I'm not sure. Um, but anyway, the 12 volt supply is presumably derived from this resistor, which gets rather hot. The 5 volt supply just comes from these two 7805s in parallel. And also, on the, in the same case, we've got a UM1286 UHF modulator, a color UHF with sound modulator, which takes the audio and composite video in from the sound coupe and um, converts it to, comp to a standard um, UHF TV signal and sends it out that way. Uh, the downside of that being uh, you get a lot of uh, video and audio crosstalk uh, coming down through this overall shielded cable. So it's not very good, but um, obviously that isn't a problem when you're using it through the, uh, the SCAR socket. And that's about it. Obviously you can, you can see here I've got a whole bunch of other stuff to, dating back about 30 years really. 
mostly Spectrum tapes and some uh, there was some Sinclair user did, uh, magazines as well with all the adverts ripped out, so uh, they don't take up a lot of space. And there's some Sam stuff here as well, such as all these uh, format magazines. And I've also got the, uh, the Sam technical manual. Oh well, we can all get boxed up and stashed away with all my other junk now. Oh, and if anyone's interested, there's a rather excellent uh, emulator called Sim Coupe, which seems to be able to do pretty much everything a real Sam Coupe can do. Thanks for watching.